All right, welcome back to the program. In case you're just joining us, it's time for our conversation. Now, so many things to talk about. Dr. Adedeji Adeniro, an economist with uh, CC Center for the Studies of Economies of Africa. I hope I got that right. Welcome to the program. Thank you. And um, I'm also being joined uh, by Abiyo Dunkerikpe. He is the head of investment research at Afroinvest in Lagos. Uh, Mr. Karikwe, how are you? Can I see you from Lagos? Hi, I'm good. I'm fine. And you, Nancy? I'm well, but you're looking so dapper, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is just this is just me. This on, this is just you. Are you sure? Every, are you sure you are not part of the GDP numbers that just came in? The the optic we are seeing. Are you sure you you are not the one that contributed to it? The way you're looking. <laughs> Those numbers are not, um, they look good if you just look at it on the year on year, but looking at long term growth potential, those numbers aren't really impressive. So, no, I'm not the one that released those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome to the show. Uh, let me still stick Thank with you. you a bit. You know, so many things to talk about. I started this discuss yesterday with my guest, Dr. Badaya Milafe, former deputy governor of the Central Bank of. Nigeria as well as uh, I had Michael and Nahoro here they tried as much as possible to dissect those numbers but I looked at it from another lens though I also brought in even the political perspective uh, into it yesterday uh, but let me ask you at this time just like you said those numbers are not too pretty and I did say in my analysis is not Uhuru yet why do you think it's not Uhuru yet despite the GDP recording the highest quarterly increase yeah, at least in the last two years, I think, or in the last three years since the recession, this is the, uh, you know, the biggest uh, growth numbers we've seen since 2016. Um, so my reason is this year, um, Nigeria is an economy that grows at an average of about 6% year on year before we had the oil price shock. So if we can grow at that rate, then why are we doing a 2% average growth now? And this growth rate, also if you look at the vis a vis um, growth rate of the population, it's significantly below population growth rate. And that doesn't tell so much positive story or positive um, narrative for the economy and for the Nigerian people. What that just means is that um, over the last three years, on average, um, Nigerians are somewhat poorer, um, and, um, which, which really is not what. Um, a good government should be looking at so a good government should be focused on how to sort of restructure the economy at this point in time and how to you know add value to the lives of the people through proper policy formation market friendly policies that would touch and impact positively on the life of the average nigerian on the street mm. okay let me come to dr adenio here in the studio um, what, 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 what is your own reading of those numbers? So, um, like a lot of analysts have certainly mentioned, um, the figure, of course, government has been celebrating uh, mm. w w what we see as um, uh, that it's uh, a testament to the fact that uh, its economic growth and re recovery program is uh, gaining momentum. But um, we should look at the drivers of what we, we are seeing. You remember and recall that 2019 is an election year. There is a lot of uh, expenditure which kind of boosts the economy. Um, so when you interpret this figure very well, you can say, OK, we, are, we, we did well. I mean, that's the highest we've seen in two years. But you, you look at um, what is very important is what should we be doing? Before we go into this recession, we are rec we, we were between six percent and four. I mean, the, the least we we had was four percent. Before we had that, that recession, our GDP in dollar terms is around five hundred uh, billion, uh, billion dollars. dollars. Yeah. And uh, when we talk about recovery, I mean, to me, I interpret it in two senses. One sense is that um, at least when you when you should recover initial position you had before or at least you should get back to the growth trend you've recorded. Because when you look at the country like Nigeria, uh, I mean, we, we, this has been we, we one documented China recording two digits growth for uh, about two decades. Uh, India is uh, having 6% growth. I mean, 
uh, almost on a uh, annual basis. So for a country like Nigeria that needs to actually uh, um, develop, given our developmental challenges, looking at poverty rates, looking at uh, joblessness, I mean, we need to do more than this. And um, when you look at um, the kind of uh, the composition of these figures, you find out that um, one of the uh, things in ICT did well. Mm. Fi financial services did well. So for me, that's positive because um, those are the degrees that hold the uh, uh, progress of the economy. But uh, the question is, are we tapping into those that are doing well? And um, are we trying to solve the problem? Because uh, like uh, the first person said, we should be doing more than we are doing. Does it mean that we have now entered into a territory whereby we would be having this sluggish growth of 2 to 3 percent? Is it the new normal that mm. we have to settle down for? It should not be the new normal. And the mm. reason why it can't be the new normal is because um, uh, in terms of the quality of our growth, I mean, when you, even if, it is, if, if, you are, if you are doing poorly and it has uh, the effect of reducing poverty, creating a lot of jobs, you, you, you can still live with that, but this is not happening such that we need both increase in magnitude of the growth we are recording and the quality because it needs to be affecting the real people on the street. Mm. Okay, um, yeah, thank you for bringing me to that. In terms of affecting the impact uh, of this on the, on the average Nigerian because that has been debated for a very long time. GDP is about what you add, what I add, the total of what everyone does uh, in the economy. But the other thing also is that when a large number of people are not doing something and one person, let's say like a Dangote, does a whole lot and as much as we'll do, the GDP numbers will also be positive, sure. isn't it? So it's not really about that we are entirely doing well, Sure, is it? I hope I've explained it to our viewers so that they can understand what we mean. Uh, but let, let me come back to you uh, in, in Lagos. Um, Dr. Adedeji has spoken about the effect and perhaps the impact and what it means to an average Nigerian. But I want to ask you, from these GDP numbers, do you really think that is, is a whole something in the sense that are we really computing economic activities totally in the country? And I know what I am saying. Uh, because we saw the last rebasing, I think in 2013, during the Okonjo Iwala days, you know, that moved our GDP, who became the largest economy uh, in Africa. But from 2013 till now, it's about seven years later, and I think we should be rebasing every five years, you know. But do you think that the, these numbers are, are holistic? Um, so speaking to the numbers again, you know, um, Nigeria is quite a very large um, 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 country. If you look at it in terms of geographical size, we're large. If you look at it in terms of population, we're massive. If you look at it in terms of the economy size, also, we, we're also still massive. So um, this speaks to the role of the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics in carrying out its usual or regular surveys. This, the approach to carrying out this survey. This this is what is. The best of my knowledge, I think the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics is doing a whole lot to sort of capture and represent the, the size of the Nigerian economy via data which we can see and assess at the click of, of a button. Now, if this data completely reflects the economy, is another story. Now, we know we also have a very large informal sector. This sector is massive and, I mean, I can't even put a, a number or a figure to that size of the sector. And it takes a whole lot to capture that sector by the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics. So it all speaks to the funding for the agency. How well is the agency funded? It speaks to its manpower capacity to be able to touch across about 774 local governments we have across Nigeria to capture business activity, economic activity as they happen possibly even on 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 a on, online real time basis you know so i mean in a way yes i would agree with you that yeah but th this data purely may not reflect i mean in the totality the size of the economy there would definitely be i mean, I mean and also statistically speaking it is a survey and you use um, a sample so out of the entire population you, you take a sample and then you base your your reading 
on the sample. So, which means there is also a proportion of that population that may not have been represented by that sample. You know, so that is that, that is okay. speaking to. You. Okay, yeah. Biadun, let me still stick with you a bit on, on the line of what we're discussing. If you take a look at those numbers, I tried as much as possible to digest and chew it. Um, you know, these sectors, I think we have about 45 sectors in the country, uh, if you take yeah. a look at it. Only six sectors are represented. Yes, yes you know, and um, they are broken down into primary, secondary, and tertiary. If you take a look at those numbers, where I saw a lacuna is the secondary sector in terms of manufacturing, not doing well, and some other uh, things in the secondary sector not doing well. But the primary sector, agriculture, but we just really have to say crop production. So it's not everything at ground, agriculture, that made a lot of sense in those numbers, and it should give us cost mm -hmm. to worry. Then for the tertiary sector, which IT belongs to, just like you mentioned, and financial services also belong to. So that's, there's something. There's a missing link, isn't it? There's really a missing link. Um, so I, I don't know. Speaking to to the missing link, um, I'm not, I'm not sure I get your question, Joe. But um, this is just what the economy is. Um, we have the like you rightly put it, the tertiary, the, I mean the primary, the tertiary, and then the secondary, and each of them represents um, how businesses and how economic activities are being conducted, giving the nearness to nature. So the closer you are to nature when, uh, in terms of generating the business activity determines how you're being classified. So agriculture is probably the closest to the ground, it's closest to, the, to nature, and that's why it will rank or be called a primary sector. And the growth of that sector really should be driven by investment. Um, we have... Um, good arable land in the country, but the challenge is investment. So um, to also bridge the gap of investment, we've seen the CBN, the, the federal government come up with different forms of intervention to boost um, fund flows, to boost the bankability of the sector. However, there are still challenges in terms of crop yields, challenges in terms of, 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 of the, the, the suitability of, of the crops that the farmers are planting, you know? and how basically they can scale up across the value chain. You know, there are still challenges with that. We, we, we already have seen the, ben we're seeing the benefit of investment across the other sectors, um, be it um, in the ICT, in the financial services. We can see the benefit there. We can see other sectors are growing, even though if you look at them, depending on the period, you could see some level of weaknesses. Now, the other sector, which is the manufacturing sector, yeah, um, we're seeing investment in that sector also, but there are structural bottlenecks that keep holding back the growth and the potential of the sector. Structural bottlenecks such as power, power is very critical for the sector. We, we see, see massive issues in that sector, debt issues, um, 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 supply is an issue. There is demand, but supply is an issue. Metering is also an issue. So, so for most businesses, they still grapple with with with, with power costs. Um, another challenge is in terms of infrastructure, okay. road network, distribution network. This is another critical challenge for that sector. Okay, Biado, well, yeah, yeah. Biado, let me just halt you and bring in Doctor Adejeji, and perhaps let me uh, further explain what. I meant when I said there was a missing link. Uh, perhaps if you can lend your voice to, sure. to answer it. Missing link in the sense that primary sector, primary to secondary to tertiary, primary you have agriculture, forestry, fishing, and all of that. The secondary you have manufacturing that is transforming those primary goods into finished products, processing. Then tertiary we have IT, banking services, and Economic all services. that. So the missing link I'm talking about is that we seem not to really connect the dot across those three sectors effectively. Sure. Because I do also think that if we're able to connect the dots, our GDP will be better than it is okay. right now. Can I explain? Yes. Uh, uh, so when you, I mean, you are right by say, pointing out to the missing link in terms of the importance of manufacturing sector. So the typical growth process uh, that's 
almost every yes. uh, almost um, our country passes through is um, you have this uh, agriculture and development of agricultural value chain this uh, 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 feeding into a, uh, a, an industrial base whereby you have you that, that leads to development of industry and when uh, uh, the industry also peak in most analysis you see uh, uh, the uh, manufacturing base increasing to between 20 to 30 percent of the GDP like China is almost approaching when also manufacturing sector peaks you see transition now to service sector whereby uh, 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 and these are, are quite uh, lucrative service sector like the financial ICT but not just only that I mean even trading and everything such that you, you, you the economic move in that direction if you look at Nigerian story we moved from an agrarian economy to the a service, service yes. based economy and the implication is that um, we uh, have access to cheap products from elsewhere whereby we can buy and we also have on one hand oil resources that we can use to buy this stuff. So instead of we developing our manufacturing and industry base, we did not. And that's actually the kind of development story we have. You look at uh, 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 job in terms of the high unemployment, you look at poverty because when you talk about decent jobs, and the kind of sector that can provide this. You have to look at manufacturing sector. You can't, agriculture is actually very uh, subsistence. And, yeah. and, the and if you look at the type of services we are growing into, it's just buying and selling. selling. Uh, because because majority of what we do in terms of buying uh, uh, our service sector, it's just um, this woman buy uh, uh, this uh, product, he sells it to this at some very, very little margin. And because a lot of people have crowded it, there is even little margin you can hide. So in a way, we've not developed the most important sector for our development, which is the industry. And so it's a missing link. And that's why there is need to actually ask the question of how can we re-industrialize? Mm -hmm. is going back. Mm -hmm. We've left that, uh, uh, we've mistakenly jumped that process. But if we want to develop as a nation, we need to develop. And mm -hmm. that is why we need strategy. Strategy, by that I mean, we need to have a plan about development. Now, are you encouraged by the fact that the ELGP expires this year, but I'm aware that, you know, there are some things in the pipeline, like a national economic pipeline from the budget and the um, the economic planning ministry mm -hmm. are you are you really aware about that that's one or are you encouraged by that in terms of when you talked about a strategy if you take a look at the even the ELGP there was a projection of growth for the country I think for last year we did not meet it definitely yeah, four, about 4.5 yes, percent. percent we didn't meet it yes. with this GDP growth so and this year is 7 percent yes <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know what I'm like for because you said this is 7 percent. Then I thought about 2020 budget 3.5 percent growth. Um, do you just think that we are working towards the goal, uh, towards the target, or we are just you know brandishing numbers for just brandishing numbers sake without putting actions to it? Two I questions. Think, um, so in terms of the numbers, I think. It shows that we are, we, we are making some moves, but very slow moves. Um, in terms of how impressive are our kind of, I mean, the whole nexus of policy, for that I'm quite afraid, given that in July this year, the African continental free it trade area. area will c come into existence. And that would uh, uh, remove that uh, illusion of Nigeria as the biggest economy in Africa. Because it means that, um, uh, the countries that are already into it, they become the largest economy. I mean, yeah. the, Africa would be just be so the largest. So, and so, yeah. you, and now we are not prepared for it. Mm. We are not into it because negotiation is taking place because we are here to rectify it. We are not part of those discussion. And people on the table are already to discussing positive stuff. And that is why you look at in terms of FDI flow in Africa. A lot of uh, uh, organizations okay. are coming in mm. because they want to take uh, 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 opportunities of this. And if you look at it, very few are coming to Nigeria. You see Ghana, uh, uh, Ghana and the rest, mm -hmm. people setting up. And those kind of flows are to say, okay, these are, this is an opportunity for uh, industrial development. This is, a, this is a huge market for me to come in, invest, and make uh, good. Nigeria needs to be part of the equation. The fact that we have not yet uh, uh, decided what will make 
uh, uh, of the biggest uh, uh, trade policy in Africa, is to me, I'm afraid that we might not actually be prepared for what is going to happen. And again, if you look at the global economy and kind of things that allow us to achieve even the modest we talked about. I mean, if you find out that oil prices were stable, mm. election years mm -hmm. was there. Um, but look at the global economy this year. Coronavirus already yeah. eating various tax yes. markets. Election year in the US, which actually means that a lot of people or global demand might actually also be very weak. Mm. If that is the case, that means uh, the kind of factors that were so good that make us to achieve just less the than 3% yeah. might not actually be mm. in place. So we need to actually sit down together and rethink. And we have, a, a private sector have a lot of role to play. But like um, the committee appointed by president, yes, when they actually uh, uh, gathered, one of the top advice they've given to the president is that we need synergy among... One government agency cannot so actually other. be moving this direction and the other moving in that direction. So you need actually to harmonize your stance. And you see it in almost everything. Just to use an example of the security, you see uh, uh, someone, uh, one part of the government saying, we want to move in the direc this direction, and another one will say, but if that can be... Uh, 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 be playing out in security, just imagine what is playing, playing out, out in the in economy. Okay, let me bring in Biodun here from Lagos. So many things to talk yeah. about, you know, <laughs> so many, so many things. Biodun, are you still there? Um, yes, I'm here. Yeah, if we take a look at the modest growth with, with, uh, which we've just experienced, what do you think we did right? If there was anything we did right at all, what are the things that were done right? Uh, that so if there were not things that we did right, or if there were some things that were done right, do you also think that perhaps because of the all price brand crude stability a bit last year that gave us this modest growth that we didn't really we shouldn't be clapping for ourselves we shouldn't be saying we shouldn't be saying party after party as it were the party was called by the oil markets you understand what i mean yes i do mm -hmm. i i mean i agree with you i mean the oil sector was primarily responsible for the growth and, and that's, of course, driven by two factors, stable oil production. Oil production increased by about 5% year on year to an average of about 2 million barrels a day. And also we saw relative stability in crude price. And that's why we saw the incremental from the oil sector. Now, the non-oil sector, if you take out the expansion from the ICT sector, the agri sector, and then the financial services sector, I mean, the, the broad-based performance for the other subsectors was, was really weak. And what this means is that um, we are still um, sort of still going to continue experiencing this sluggish pace of, of, of growth in the absence of reforms and other market-friendly policies, you know. Um, so it's, it's not like we've done a whole lot, right? I mean, the, well, we, if we just drill down for financial services, I mean, we've attributed that growth to the sort of um, CBN intervention with the banks towards the last quarter of 2019 with the policy to sort of compel them to increase lending to the real sector or to consumers, basically, you know. And outside that, there isn't really any major magic that we've done or that the government has done and which the impact is what resulted into the growth we're seeing. And then that speaks to our outlook for 2020 and even, I mean, when we launched our 2020 outlook at our Invest, we had a 10-year 10 10-year 10 view for, for the outlook, and we're talking over the next decade. And the things we sort of hammered on is that if we continue in this um, sort of trajectory, this sort of slow growth backed by fragile weak oil performance, not too impressive non-oil sector, I mean, growth, then between now and 20, end of another, I mean, 10 years, where do we see the economy landing? If if if, if there are no market-friendly policies, if if things we see is around city, around um, um, power sector, around FX environment, are not coped, coupled with other inefficiencies across the, the country, those things, if they were not coped, then we we'll just continue to see ourselves rolling in this two to three percent growth 
range for another 10 years. And, and it then also means that this current administration has a lot of work to do because they are supposed to set like a, a platform, a playing field for the next administration to come and build on. Now, in a way, it looks like they are doing one or two things that sounds um, interesting and attractive if you look at, at the focus they've given to infrastructure development in terms of road, a, a few touch points on airport, um, not a lot around the seaport and things like that. You could give them a bit of thump up in that direction. But in the broader picture of things, they need to sort of set a, a, a very strong I mean, playing field for the next administration that, so that they can build on it. Then and, and this sort of thing can sort of take Nigeria back to, to, to the path of prosperity. Mm. You know, that's just my thoughts around this. Okay. Um, let me stick with you a bit. The EAC, the Economic Advisory Council, was set up last year, sometime uh, towards the end of last year. Uh, I think they've yeah. had meetings with the president, to my knowledge, whether two or three times, at least that we saw publicly, that I saw photo ops. Um, do you think now, because I can imagine that Dr. Doin Salami, Bismarck Riwani, and Chukuma Solud, Professor Chukuma Soludo and the rest, must have given the president advice behind closed doors. But with what yeah. we are seeing right now, because the EAC, as it were, may not necessarily have the power. They will give advice to the president. If the president deems it fit, he takes the advice. Do you think at this point, with what we've seen, I think it's up to six months or thereabout, do you think yes. that it is essential now for the president to have like an economic think tank, perhaps, um, I don't want to say an economic management team, but perhaps an economic management committee or team, but will not have the coloration that he used to have before, where you had the central bank governor, the VP, which I, I hope you understand what I mean. Yeah, maybe I would think it should be more of an economic implementation team. Okay. <laughs> I think you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, be able to... to implement ideas. We, we have... Yes. Yes, go ahead. We, experienced people in this country. He has appointed people of good quality as his economic advisory council. I believe over the last six months, there must have been two, three good ideas that would have been presented to the president. However, we really are not seeing any traction as to implementation of this idea. Mind you, we actually do not even know if any ideas have been presented because none of the, the details of most of those meetings are not in public. really mm. are not made public. So we really cannot drill down to the details of the details. Allow me to say that. Um, but that, that being said, it is, it is no gain saying that this team, given their experience, given their quality, would have made good suggestions to the president. However, implementation is lacking. So I think what we need is implementation. And I don't think we need to set up some strong, I mean, set up some flowery, colorful thing as to look at implementation. It's about just drilling down to the details, to the very basic, to the very basic, and then pick it a step at a time and implement. And over now and another two or three years that this administration still has to run, we'll begin to see good in terms of recovery and in terms of growth. Okay. Dr. Adedeji, do you have anything else to add? Uh, Biodo was of the fact that it should not just be an economic management team, again, apart from the EAC. It should be an implementation, you know, an implementation committee. But that's actually what the, the, the role of actually what ministries are, are supposed to do. Because they implement government policies. policies. But the problem, I, I think, is in terms of our policy over the last uh, uh, four years, has been that government has actually been very reactive, not quite proactive in terms of what it does. So you see ERPGs like uh, reacting to shock that affected the economy. Almost everything has been to manage a crisis rather than we uh, are taking the bold step of asking uh, what do we want. Um, we, we need some bold and uh, very strong policy statement to say, okay, we want to develop this sector. 
Of course, I, I think I appreciate what they're doing in rice. But we need, because it's not just rice. I mean, we need something that would map out like 20 or even more uh, economic product that we want to be in the, your program early in, earlier in the morning. You talked about cocoa. cocoa yeah. And how much Ghana is doing um, yes, in terms of cocoa. Because, yeah. And given that the, 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 the kind to control the market, they can determine the price. What stopped Nigerians from also tapping into that sector and also uh, uh, doing, a, uh, I mean, what we can do? We have the population, we have the land, we have almost everything working for us, but we don't have the kind of incentives that would actually spring uh, a lot of development in that area. There are also other areas, for example, even the one we are recording good, like the ICT and the rest. But you find out that the, this ICT is just more of um, this big tech company coming in and um, selling a lot of the products. Can we tap into this in terms of uh, uh, developing ourselves? In one report that we are working on in terms of the uh, digital preparedness of Africa, when we ranked five, all the Af uh, 38 African countries, Nigeria came about um, 23rd. And why is the reason for this? S skills and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. If we are going to tap into this kind of uh, economic opportunities that, because, uh, we, we, we tend to see problem and a lot of weakness in the global economy. But given our own population, given about the position we are in, we are still very there at the, uh, at the bottom. At the we have a lot of potential f uh, for development and we need to tap into this potential. And like you mentioned, industry and manufacturing sector is a critical area to look okay, into. Okay, just in 45 seconds, because we have to go uh, in a few minutes, the global economy headwinds that we're seeing right now it seems no one is even talking about it and i'm really surprised that i'm not seeing narratives come from the economic space in nigeria in terms of okay coronavirus is hitting a lot of countries uh developed countries most the second biggest economy china we do a lot of business with china they, they buy most of our oil. yes they, they also buy most of our oil, so it will affect also demand sure. i've analyzed it here no one is really talking about that the imf has get downgraded and all of that how does this play out in um the economy moving forward for 2020 quickly so, so i mean what that means is that we face a depressed uh, global economy which means we would not be able to uh, uh rely on the our sales uh, or increasing our, our more output. OPEC is likely to, dan uh, to cut down on even more oil production. Oil price would not be uh, so strong too because of many of these policies because it will be fluctuating due to uh, uh, politics and the uh, global economy. So the essence is that we face a very challenging year, I mean globally, mm -hmm. and Nigeria is not insulated, insulated. from that. Okay, quickly, Biodu, let me end with you. Uh, what are your thoughts as we close the program today? Are there like three things we should do? Quick, very quick, three things in 30 seconds. Your, sti your time yeah, starts so now. <laughs> so I said it already, policy, we need to enable the right policies. We need to enable market-friendly policies. Mm. We need to cut down on subsidies, wastages from subsidies. And lastly, we need to be more aggressive on implementation. Mm. Fantastic. I wish I could go on and on with both of you, though. You know, issues around the economy is so deep. Like I said yesterday, as you dice through it, your opening is like an onion. You are opening yeah, yeah. an onion. Where do we go to? We you know, so it's, it's so much. I started yesterday. I'm continuing today. I want to say I'll be first to tomorrow, but I don't want to say so. <laughs> <laughs> because there are a lot of issues to contend with when it comes to economy and finance, which I keep my eyes here on. So I want to say thank you both for coming on the program, for joining me today. I wish you a lovely day, Biodo in Lagos. Say me hi to you. your Afroinvest colleagues. Say me mm -hmm. hi to Ike Choke. I don't know if he's watching now, but tell him, long time no CEO, you know. So thank you, Biodo, for joining us. All thank right. you, Nancy. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Adedeji, too, thanks. for joining us. Say me hi to CC team. I no keep problem. watching. I know you people are always watching. So <laughs> <keep> watching. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I've been speaking with uh, Dr. Adede Giardiniro, an economist with CC, that is the Center for the Study of Economies of Africa, as well as uh, Biodu Kerekbe, who is the head investment research at AfriInvest. We've been looking at the Nigerian economy, trying as much as possible to, uh, you know, break down those numbers and what it implies. Please join us again tomorrow. Same time.